practically what that looks like to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. But before we get to that, let me ask you guys some more questions. Did you like the game with, with all the questions? It's kind of fun to get to know each other and also smack people with pool noodles. So that's always a win. So um, unless you're Jeff and you're getting smacked repeatedly <laughs> by somebody in a blindfold. All right, but, but what's the most annoying question somebody's asked you? What time is it? Or are we there yet? Would that apply? Can I play with you? Can I play with you? Is that a sibling that's asked? Okay. Are you tied to from everybody in the school? When everybody in the school goes, are you Titus' sister? Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry. Are you from China? China. <laughs> nice, yeah. Are your cousins twin? Are they? Oh, they are. Nice. Nice. <laughs> like I would know if we have a test today. I'm not that good of a student. All right, what's the best question somebody has asked you? Do you want ice cream? That is an excellent question. Do you want to go to Rascal's Fun Zone? How many cookies do you want? The answer is there's never enough. Do you want to sleep in? What do you want for your birthday? No money. Uh, no, money is no object. That's, that's a good one to hear too when, when that question is asked. I can pour as much chocolate syrup on your ice cream. How much do you want? What day, is it? what day is it? That's the best question somebody's asked you? Oh, we've moved on from that. <laughs> okay, okay. That, that's, that's, good. that's good. Okay, what's, what's a question you find yourself asking a lot? What did you say? <laughs> I forget, that's not a question. Okay, it's a question you ask yourself a lot. What time is it? What should I do? What class period is this? Why am I not in bed right now, like every hour of the day? Can they come over? Nice. Where did I put my stuff? Yes, that's why they, they created those air tags that you just put them on every... I need to get some for Chelsea and put it on our keys, put it on our phone, put it on our... I got her an Apple Watch for her birthday a few years ago thinking she doesn't ever have to ask me where her phone is anymore because she can do this. Ready? Watch this. Watch. Ready? Oh, there it is. Right? But no. She'll still ask me just as much and I'll look at her wrist and go, where's your watch? Oh, it's charging. I forgot to take it off. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we, we get it. Questions are a huge part of life. Maybe, maybe a question that you don't ask yourself super often is, where did I see God today? Has anybody ever told you to think through that question? Like, where have I seen God today? Because let's, let's be honest. Like, the world is full of a lot of stuff, and a lot of it is not great. And if we're not careful, we'll tend to skew negative every time. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll remember the negative things. Like, you guys know what, it, what it's like when, when people give you, like, you might, you might do something, like give a, give a presentation or give a speech about monkeys or something like that. And you, you'll have, like, ten people tell you, good job, and that one person was like, could have been better. You're not going to remember any of the compliments. You're going to remember the negative thing, right? I'm this way. You're this way. That's kind of how we, how we are wired, I think, in a lot of ways. So when we see a lot of stuff in the world, and a lot of it's pretty negative, Sometimes, if we're not careful and we don't intentionally look for the good, we'll miss where the good is happening. So when you ask yourself, where did I see God today? It forces you to see and, and look for the ways that God might have been working and, and you might not have been paying attention. Or, or maybe it'll make you more grateful for the good things that you did see. Uh, where, where did you see God today? See, when we struggle to see God's goodness and love in our everyday lives, we, we usually do one of two things, okay? When we, when we don't see where God is working, when we don't see the good, when, when we struggle to see where God is working, 
we do one of two things. One is we either step up because we see a need and we go, you know what? I don't see where God is working in this need right now in my school, in my house, in my community or whatever. So I'm going to step up and I'm going to fill that need because I know it's something that needs to be done and I want to be part of God's plan to make it happen. Or the second thing is we, we step away. We step back. And we kind of like, it, it's almost like a defense mechanism. It's like, you know what? I'd rather just like try to ignore it than to try to be a part of the solution and, or try to look for good and not be able to find any and then be super bummed out or whatever. It's easy sometimes to just like step back. But if you've heard of like fight or flight, it's kind of almost that response where you either fight or you, you fly away. You, you fight or flight. You, you either step up or you step back. That's generally the response we have when it comes to where is God in this situation. And, and that's, that's, I think, a natural human response. So uh, it, it, it would be normal for us to, to react in one of those two ways. But what we want to do is hopefully train our minds, renew our minds, renew our spirits, and, and start stepping up to the plate when it comes to those two options. Because... You and I know people that have stepped back and we wish they would have leaned in and pushed a little harder. And maybe you've had times in your life where you wished maybe you didn't back down, but maybe that you stood up for what you knew was right, or what you knew needed to happen, what you knew you needed to do, what you felt the Spirit convicting you to do, but you kind of stepped away because it was easier. And so, and so we know what that's like. And, and that, in fact, a whole lot has not really changed in our world from, like, like technology has changed a lot, but as far as the way we're wired, as far as the way that we respond to things in our lives, that really hasn't changed in the history of mankind. And so, like, when Paul was walking around and he, he was on his missionary journeys and he was sending letters to all these different places and, 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 and planting churches, he was facing the same kind of stuff. And the people in those churches were facing a lot of the same kinds of things that we face today. And, and he knew this. And so, uh, he, he comes, and he, we, we've been in Galatians recently. We're going to be back in Galatians for this series. But, but Paul is, is, is in the church in, in Galatia, and, uh, and he, he sees this kind of thing, and he, he recognizes, he actually calls out and notices where it looks like things are pretty dim, where, where it seems like maybe, is God really in that situation where, where people would have questioned those things? And he points that out, but, but then he moves from that. But it's crazy how, like, this was written probably like 50 A.D., and, and so that's like almost 2,000 years ago at this point. And, uh, and, and so, but again, not a whole lot has changed since then to now as far as the way that, that we as humans respond to the world around us. Good news is that Paul goes on to give them some encouragement and, and to show what this looks like. Um, but, but I want to take you back to something that the Apostle John recorded about what Jesus said before we get into what Paul said. So, are you guys still with me? So, let's go back in time a little bit and, and, and look to maybe like 20 years back in time to about 30 AD when, when Jesus was with his disciples and he's teaching them. And, and do you guys remember a few months ago where we talked about the passage where, where uh, we talked about how uh, the, the, the good shepherd looks out for his sheep and, and we talked about that idea a little bit. Um, but... But we talked about something, and this is what Jesus says in John chapter 10. He says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, right? And he's talking within the context of like, like literally like sheep and cattle, livestock. They were like, uh, they, they were a sign of wealth if you had a lot of them. But they were also like, that was how you lived. Like, that, like you could make a living with that, like a lot of people do today. But... This, this was a huge deal. And, and if somebody came and took your livestock, took your sheep, then that, that ate into like the, the way you could live, the, the way you would feed your family, the, the way that you could you know, integrate into society by using your livestock and being... So a thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus contrasts that by saying, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. If you missed that series, I encourage you to go back on our YouTube channel and watch some of that stuff because this, this really the heart of, of God is that, you know what, there's an enemy that's out there. There's darkness in the world because the enemy, the thief, he has come to kill and destroy. But I have come. I am the good shepherd. I look out for my sheep. My sheep know me and they know my voice. I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. 
Or some translations say, have it abundantly. Have abundant life. And, and, and we have to remember that that is the truth. That is the heart of God. So then going back to Paul, he, he, Jesus wants us to have a full life. A life to the full. And, and, and what, when Paul comes in, he, he starts talking to uh, the church in Galatia. And, and he wants them, and what I want you to recognize is that oftentimes God is doing more than we can see. Like how many of you, you've, you've stared at a situation, there's, there's aspects of it that you don't quite understand and don't recognize, but there's more happening behind the scenes than you realize. Like how many of you have ever been to a play? Maybe, maybe it's at your school, and you see the actors on stage, and they're performing, and, but what you don't see is the sound person hitting play on the music and the soundtrack. What you don't see is the, the stagehands backstage pulling the curtains and, and setting up props when the lights go dim, right? You don't see that stuff, but it's happening. And it's for the good of the show. And what's real about life is God is doing more than what you can see behind the scenes. And, and, and so Paul, he, he goes on to, in, to, to tell them how God is working behind the scenes through his spirit. Um, and, and to kind of demonstrate this, I want you to check out this video. It's, it's, it's a video of like, have you guys ever been to a, a fancy dinner? Or maybe you've seen a movie or a show that has like a fancy dinner. And, and there's like these ice sculptures in it. Like, like uh, check out this quick time lapse uh, of this ice, ice sculpture. Just like a block of ice that gets transformed into something beautiful. Isn't that kind of insane how quickly and how, how cool uh, somebody can, can take just a chunk of ice and make it something completely different? And it gets more and more detailed as he goes. Isn't that insane? It's like a swan, I think. A swan in flight. So, but you see how, how cool that is. Okay, the, the, the sculptor takes a look at this big chunk of ice, but they've got a picture in their mind of what it could be. They see the swan. You and I see the big chunk of ice. They see the swan. And their job as a sculptor is to get rid of all the pieces that are not the swan. That's essentially what they're doing. And they chip pieces away until you see what they saw in their mind, which is the swan. They make it come to life by taking all the pieces that aren't the swan away. And that's exactly what the Spirit does in us. He takes away the things in our lives and in our hearts that are not the Spirit. Because the, the reality is, and the truth about our faith is that kind of our whole life is a sculpture being made. And it's the Spirit transforming us and making us into His image. The more that we follow Jesus, the more that we look like him. The more we act like him, the more we talk like him, the more we treat others like him in love. But you and I naturally don't, don't react to things that way. We are naturally like jealous, selfish creatures, undisciplined. Like our, our knee-jerk reaction to annoying questions is usually not kind, right? Uh, sometimes our filter catches it and we act nice and sometimes it doesn't. But the reality is all that stuff in us that is, is not like Jesus, that is kind of our own natural inclination and our knee-jerk reactions, that stuff has to get taken away. And the Spirit does that in our life. I like the way Romans 12 says it, where he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that has to take place in order for you to be more like Jesus. And so the Spirit, alive and active in your life, is what transforms you in, into the image of God by taking away the pieces that are not of him. And, and so uh, this is how Paul describes it. He goes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit, right? What, what is fruit? It's the product of a tree or a plant. And you can know what that tree or plant is by the fruit that it produces, right? You're not going to plant an apple uh, seed and get 
an orange tree, you're going to get an apple tree. And you know it's an apple tree because there's apples coming from it, right? And the same is true in your life. People will know that you are a follower of Jesus. They will know that the Spirit lives inside of you by the fruit you produce in your life. And that fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. When you embody the Spirit, and He does His work in you to take away the pieces that aren't of Him, the result that will be produced in your life is the fruit that comes from God. And it will be nourishing and refreshing to those around you. And it will give life to others. That's what it looks like when God is working behind the scenes in your own life. God is doing more than you and I can see in most situations, I would say in all situations. God is doing more than we can see. So how, how does that come to life in our own lives? How, how, do, how does that come to be? First, I want you to choose to believe that God is doing more than you can see. I know when, when life is great, it's easy to point and look how God's doing so many amazing things. But when life is really hard, when difficult things happen, when you are exposed to things that just are really terrible, it's really hard to see where God's working in that. And I've been there. I've been in both places. But I want you to start by believing that backstage, God is doing something that you're not aware of. And secondly, I want you to choose to look for God in those situations. Look for him around you. The next time you have a bad day or something goes terribly wrong or you're in a difficult circumstances, uh, in a difficult circumstance, I want you to change the way you see what's in front of you. Start looking for where God is working and, or maybe step up and ask God where he can use you to work in that situation. Right? Maybe even, there, there's something psychological about when we say things out loud, something in us believes it more. Right? Saying something out loud, there's, you can have a thought about something, but the minute you start saying it out loud, you're, it's like your spirit knows it's true even more. It, it, it solidifies in our hearts. So maybe you just need to start saying out loud, the things in front of me feel messy, but I'm choosing to believe that God is doing more than I can see right now. Maybe you have to just start by saying that out loud or ask, where can I see God in what I'm going through? And maybe that's just your prayer and you pray it out loud. God, where can I see you working in this situation? Because I'll be honest, I don't really see much of you right now. You have to choose to believe that God is working in ways that you are unaware of right now. And, and you have to look for where that might be. There are glimpses all around that remind us that God is doing more than we can see. And so as you guys go to your groups, that's the question I want you to start with, okay? Where did you see God today? And maybe I know it's only like 9.45 in the morning, so maybe for you that question is, where did you see God this last week? But don't you think about that question. In your small groups, start to discuss this because the moment you start to verbalize and start to recognize and look for where this is true in your life, the more you're going to be able to start believing that God is actually working behind the scenes, the more you're going to be drawn to him. And, and, and those are all great things. And we're going to get into more of what this looks like over the next few weeks in this series. And I encourage you, come back, be a part of this study, invite some friends, because this is something that I think if you get this down, it will it'll radically transform your own life, your family life, your relationships, your friendships. It will change your whole outlook and perspective on everything. When you start to allow the Spirit to do his work in you the way that God intended. And that starts by recognizing that God is at work in all things.